Prince Aegis in London was the Boston portraitist John Singleton Copley. Copley was Boston Irish and born poor. His mother ran a tobacco shop and he had to pull himself up by the bootstraps in what was, from the viewpoint of painting, a desert. Boston had no professional painters of any standing and they were seen as craftsmen, like tailors or cobblers, which, Copley admitted, is more than a little mortifying to me. But he stuck to his easel and carved himself out a career as portraitist to the solid, expanding merchant class of Massachusetts, Tories mostly, including figures like Jeremiah Lee, whom he painted in full fig at full length and girth with his wife for their mansion north of Boston. Copley's career really begins with this little portrait of his half-brother called Boy with the Squirrel. He was 27 years old when he painted it and he knew that his best hope of breaking into a wider professional sphere lay in London and specifically with Sir Joshua Reynolds. Without the support of such people, he would always be a provincial. But with their support, he could go anywhere. So he put all his acquired tricks into it. The sheen and reflections on that mahogany table the minute rendition of the hairs of the little glider squirrel, the glitter of the gold chain, and the rosy flesh of his half-brother's face. He sent the canvas off to Reynolds in London, and after an agonising wait of several months, word came back that the great man approved. Something really new, it seemed, had come out of the American After an agonising wait of several months, word came back that the great man approved. Something really new, it seemed, had come out of the American wilderness. But Copley was a timid man, and he didn't get to London for another nine years. Business in Boston was too good. He married into a rich Tory family, but his subjects weren't all Tories. Some of them were figures in the coming revolution, like Paul Revere, the silversmith, who was one of the leading dissenters in Boston. Copley's portrait of Revere is a manifesto of democratic American pride in skilled work, the radical as craftsman. No finery here, he sits in his shirt sleeves, thinking, confronting you. The stolid dome of his head rhymes with the teapot that he's holding. Sober, workmanlike, materialist, obstinate, those are the adjectives for Copley and nowhere more than in this portrait of Washington's aide and future governor of Pennsylvania, Thomas Mifflin, with his wife, Sarah. Very plain, the only note of bright colour being a little flower on Sarah Mifflin's bodice. This is marriage seen as enlightened equality. Conventional 18th century portraiture had the wife looking admiringly at her husband. Here it's reversed. Sarah Mifflin fixes us with a slightly questioning gaze while her husband looks at her with manifest pride. An ideal republic of two. Copley never got better than this and American portraiture seldom did. In 1778, Copley poured the lessons of Rome and London into a history painting in the grand manner. Except it was an odd kind of history painting because it wasn't about an important public event. It was commissioned by an English trader called Brooke Watson to commemorate something awful that befell him when he was a young man in the slave and sugar trade in Cuba. He'd fallen over from a boat in Havana Harbour and a giant shark chomped his leg off. In some ways, Watson and the Shark reminds me of those pious ex-votos that one used to see in rural chapels in Spain, where a picture is commissioned to celebrate your miraculous delivery from a landslide or a lightning storm or a shipwreck. Except, of course, that it's a very sophisticated painting and it is full of art historical illusions. A Roman statue called the Borghese Gladiator, rotated through 90 degrees, gave Copley the body of Watson. 
The figures in the boat owe a lot to Raphael, especially the Raphael of the tapestry cartoon known as the Miraculous Draft of Fishes. Despite its classical quotes, it's a melodramatic painting, and that shark charging out of the milky green sea can still give you a nasty turn. It was meant to be scary, to signify the uncontrollable, remorseless power of nature. Jaws the first. Probably he'd never actually seen a shark, though. This one has no gills, and it has lips like a toothpaste ad. Most startling to a modern eye is Copley's treatment of the black crewman. Blacks up to now had only figured in American art as servants, slaves. But this man is given the full dignity of an individual. He anchors the composition, he holds the line that is to be thrown to Watson, and in his calm and apparent concern, he acts as a sort of Greek chorus to the horrific event, on equal terms with the whites.